Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach podcast. I am Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach, and today we're going to be deep diving into the world of tinnitus. Now it's Tinnitus Awareness Month, and this is something that plagues millions of people around the world, especially in India. I speak to so many friends who talk about this. I possibly have it. I know the show's producer definitely has, um, you know, it uh, proven. So today we're going to be deep diving into understanding what tinnitus is, and we have. a fantastic guest with us dr vijay to discuss this with us dr vijay thank you so much for joining us on the habit coach podcast it's my pleasure it's my pleasure thank you for having me dr vijay can you tell us a little bit about yourself yeah so uh, i am dr vijay rangachari i am a consultant in the department of ent and head and neck surgery at manipal hospitals placed at whitefield in itpl road in bangalore so uh, my special interest is a bit of uh, you know inner ear and uh, hearing issues and the complications coming along with that so tinnitus comes one of those uh, range of topics so we will be happy to share some of our domain expertise with you amazing doctor what is tinnitus yes so tinnitus is uh, like uh, an often self diagnosed disease like people or uh, i would say patients come to us say doctor i have tinnitus so tinnitus is not the disease tinnitus is just a manifestation it's a symptom what we call as a phantom noise in the ears sometimes it's of a whooshing type sometimes it's of a beating type sometimes a rustling type so different kinds of noises which are not real but yes they are produced or rather they are felt by the patient and when they come to us it can be very mild it can be very distressing that the bottom line is there is an undesirable noise which is present in the ears the unfortunate part about that is we can't uh, quantify it we can't you know diagnose it it's only the patient who says and we have to go by their words i have a sound i have tinnitus and i give him something or some prescription and tomorrow he says i don't have it so i have to believe only the patient's versions there is no way i can objectively find out if he really has it unless it's really loud which may be in some cases of course so basically coming back to the bottom line tinnitus is a phantom noise which may be felt in the ears sometimes in the head sometimes in the brain which is quite disturbing sometimes it picks up in the early stages sometimes it's ignored for some time and then the patient comes to us with a uh, terribly disturbing and you know uh, sleep disturbing kind of a sound which is again a different range of tinnitus so it's just a noise it's a noise in the ears or the head so that's interesting it's a symptom like probably like a fever is a symptom of of something else that is happening yes, in the body absolutely. but a fever absolutely. you can measure this you can't measure is that what it is yes yes we can neither measure nor we can be sure if it's hmm. really there or it's not there at all no we have to totally trust the patient's description as well as the patient's description of it getting better or getting worse or getting cured so interesting so does this borderline between a physical ailment and a mental ailment is it no i won't you... say that way the, it is hmm. again i told you it's a manifestation Manifest. so it is it has mostly an organic basis which means mm-hmm. there is some underlying cause and uh, it may be due to different reasons so it is mm-hmm. definitely a physical manifestation but yes if somebody is getting over stressed about it getting paranoid then it may border to a mental ailment also how it's it's like how we manage it so that also that there are two dimensions to managing it when we'll come to that i'll uh, discuss about that as well interesting and and how does this start what is there a trigger to to this are people born with this how when does this manifest okay so to understand we have to first understand what is the reason so there can be many reasons for this which may start from some kind of an obstruction so to uh, discuss tinnitus you have to first localize so the localization has to be in the organ so why does the patient with tinnitus come to us why does he go to a heart specialist why does he go to a you know a orthopedic surgeon so the problem is felt in the ear so naturally the person seeks 
attention from my ear especially thinking something is wrong with my ear or something is wrong with my head or that part of the head from where the ear is attached so it is an organ specific thing and basic and most common reason we see is some kind of disturbance in the hearing of the person this is the commonest reason now uh, coming from the pandemic time let me take you through there uh, this era so people who have been into lot of work from home i'm talking about the simple let's go from simple to complex so the right. simplest reasons which we have encountered in the last 2 years online uh, school plus work from home this combo has been i you know uh, uniformly disturbing for adults as well as children and uh, what i have found is that prolonged use of headphones you know mm-hmm. something which is the commonest and most easily decipherable cause has led to so much of noise trauma trauma to the ears so somewhere what happens your brain is used to sound inputs from the ear through the nerves and what is happening when there is some kind of an excess sound or an acoustic trauma or a prolonged trauma or a long duration of uh, music or maybe calls at high volumes what is happening that some kind of your fine hearing fibers start to get damaged so that kind of a disequilibrium or a loss of equal amount of sound signals from one part of the ear to the brain and there is a difference in the other side suppose you've got one sided ringing sound or tinnitus what is the reason the first thing i would look into is yes you have been using some kind of headphones or music or very loud volume audio devices be it a school program or a school online course or office work so you have been subjected to some kind of an acoustic trauma when this acoustic trauma reaches a limit beyond which the ear can't tolerate see every organ has a capacity to withstand to some extent and when you traumatize it beyond that point we end up in some kind of damage but the ear is such a fine organ such a fine organ that the microscopic levels of damage which can't be detected by any method will be manifested as a ringing sound so that is the earliest sign of some kind of a minor assault or a minor trauma to your hearing fibers and this is because of the headphones that we wear is it different for people who wear those big headphones are, are there any uh, better options because it seems like this working from home is going to be around for a while for us yeah. yes yes so since uh, this is the commonest mechanism of damage we find that you know using headphones as well as earphones or what you call inside the ear ear pods Correct. so both are equally responsible to some extent in my experience headphones because they completely isolate you and you are not aware of the amount of loudness to which you are subjecting yourself so that along with that i also think it's also because of the duration mm. so the duration the long duration hours together every day continuously your uh, ear is subjected to acoustic trauma and you are definitely ending up with some amount of damage in your hearing fibers and you say something like to uh, make things easy for our layman patient i say it's like you know the crying of an injured organ so that's what you perceive as a tinnitus so this is the commonest reason which we find in uh, common people so which is mostly you know causing due to prolonged sound uh, usage and apart from this kind of chronic as in like uh, uh, that takes a while to happen can it also happen because of accidents because of loud noises how what are the other ways in yes so which... the same principle if it happens over a prolonged period maybe it has been for 6 months or say one year that is one category second doctor i went for diwali one cracker burst near my ear so that fills up the other side why did it happen only on the left ear because there was a atom bomb which burst near my left ear and from the time i've been ringing these sounds so often this is other type of tinnitus which is a sudden trauma or you have some kind of a uh, altitude difference suppose you have done a bungee jumping and suddenly there's been a rupture in your eardrum or there's been an increased pressure in your eardrum so some fluid accumulates 
and these are the causes for sudden ringing sounds and of course another uh, very commonly missed one is a sudden hearing loss so what happens in some people who get something like a viral attack in the ear so the hearing uh, nerve gets badly traumatized and there is a total disruption of hearing to the extent of going to 80 to 90 percent in a single day often people miss it and we feel sad that you know the other ear has been given by god to compensate but sometimes you don't realize that one is out of order because the other one is working well and your work mm. is going on so what happens then the sudden trauma leads to a sudden kind of a dead ear almost a dead ear and you realize it a little later and then it's difficult to treat so it's always better when you find some kind of a disequilibrium or a sudden loss of uh, hearing on one side before it goes into the stage that you start hearing ringing sounds you should pick it up now there are also some simple causes like you know wax accumulation in the ears which prevents the normal smooth flow of sound to the eardrum and to the hearing now because of the physical obstruction so those can be a very very simple causes in elderly people sometimes sometimes people who have the habit of picking the ears too much or those who are using too much of ear pods or too much of uh, you know headphones they push the wax inside and it gets blocked on the eardrum so the normal passage of sound when it is not uh, reaching your inner ear you get this kind of abnormal whooshy sounds or some disturbances or some rustling sounds in the ears which are very mild but that can be another pointer so essentially we need to check the ear starting from the outer ear the middle ear and the inner ear and try to figure out where the problem lies so that is the physical treatment for the way that you would start thinking about it but you know yes. you described my situation perfectly to a t diwali firecracker went off and ever since then, okay. there's that wee, 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 wee that's been happening in my ear. It's possible, yes. It's a Correct? possibility. So from, from that point on. And uh, in your case, I may also uh, you know, understand it could be because of prolonged usage of headphones for recording purposes or other professional reasons. You may be Correct. subjected to some kind of a noise trauma, which leads to slow, you know, maybe microscopic or sub-microscopic, very minute uh, hearing changes, which then manifest as... Uh, some kind of a ringing sounds because as I told you when one side is having a little trauma the other side is slightly better what happens the brain gets unequal inputs from both sides when there are unequal inputs then the brain starts getting confused and it starts generating its own noises so sometimes people start feeling a noise in the head so that is another type of tinnitus so basically it is just a phantom noise which is due to some disturbance in the equilibrium of your hearing apparatus which is the commonest cause this is so interesting because i can imagine going and telling like my parents or telling a family member that this is happening and they'll be like like but like show me proof like how how do i know that this is because that's the way that it's you very, know, it's family... very difficult to prove you have to just believe the person and assume he's honest with his symptoms yeah absolutely and um, doctor, in your experience, when somebody comes with tinnitus, what is the way that you would, you know, suggest treatment or what is the procedure that you would ask yes. this person to do? So we will have to first go into a very important and detailed uh, history taking. So as I have taken you through, what are the preceding events? Was there any acoustic trauma? Is there an occupational history of usage of prolonged you know, headphones or prolonged uh, music uh, listening due to? Is there personal reasons or professional commitments? Is there any history of any drug usage? Some of the medications have prone to like streptomycin and other, you know, canamycin uh, and all those mycin group of drugs which are called as aminoglycosides. These are prone to cause some kind of hearing usage. In kidney infection, they are used as injections for a long time. So if there's any history of drug intake or any prolonged antibiotic usage, some anti-malarials like quinine, they are prone to cause these kind of ringing sounds. So is there any history of drug intake, previous illness? So these are the common things which we ask in the history. Once we are able to somewhat narrow the reason, sometimes removing the offending agent or the drug can cause some improvement in the problem. So once all this is cleared, then we will have to go for an examination, which is the essential crux of the matter. So we go for an examination of the ear, starting from the outer ear, the middle ear, the eardrum, 
Beyond that, you can't see with your eyes, with your equipment. We can see up to the eardrum. If that looks something uh, towards a pointer, like we have, uh, say, a wax or some fluid we are able to see, we try to treat that and try to see if we can solve the problem. Now, beyond that, what happens uh, once you see most common uh, presentation, which we see is everything looks normal. There's nothing in the ear. You just see a normal eardrum and the patient is saying, uh, oh, no, 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 non-stop sounds in my ear. So we'll have to go to the next stage, which is assessment of the inner ear. So the inner ear is the most important and the most complex organ because it houses both hearing and balance. The balance and hearing nerves are like twins. They both come together from the brain stem and enter the inner ear and they stay there packaged together. And that's why they are like very good neighbors. Often you have hearing and uh, you know, ringing sounds. You also have other symptoms like uh, giddiness. So that is another step deeper into the problem. If you're having you know, something associated symptom like uh, giddiness along with your uh, ringing sounds. So that takes you into the next step of assessment. And we start usually with a very simple test, which is called as an audiogram. An audiogram helps you to understand the hearing fibers and the hearing status and compare both the good ear and the bad ear. Sometimes you have equal ringing sounds on both sides. So it helps to match and understand, yes, there has been some acoustic trauma, some hearing damage in both the ear fibers. So if it is uniform on both sides, usually it is a pointer towards acoustic trauma, especially in your higher frequencies, which get damaged first. That's why when you're conversing, our speech frequencies are between 500 to 2000 hertz. So we don't find that we are finding any difficulty in communication. Like, okay, I'm hearing fine. Why are you doing a hearing test for me? That will be the usual query of the patient. So we have to explain to them that usually it is the higher frequencies which get affected. They are the more delicate fibers. And those fibers then start generating these noises because of lack of normal sound signals which lead to deficiency in the brain's understanding and leads to abnormal sounds. So this is the way we take them through. And uh, the audiogram usually gives some amount of a clue. We call it as a pure tone audiogram. It's done by giving some kind of a sound stimulation of different frequencies from a computer software by putting headphones in a soundproof acoustic room. And that gives us a graph which compares the right and left and gives us some kind of an information to understand how the inner ear is functioning. Now, if that is also clear, then uh, we see, okay, audiogram also has nothing to offer. It looks completely normal. Then what else do you do? We go to the next level of uh, in investigation, which is an MRI of the brain and the hearing nerves, which is the vestibular and the cochlear nerves, which show if there are any swellings or any rare causes like tumors in the hearing nerve which are usually very uncommon, but it's not that we don't see them at all. Sometimes that's what I was telling you, that there is a possibility of a coexistence of a giddiness or an imbalance along with ringing sounds. That the case when you expect something more happening in the ear, like some tumors in the hearing nerve or the auditory or the vestibular, the balance organs, where you find those contributing as tinnitus may have a deeper and more sinister story to it so the tumor might be actually pressing on both these nerves and yes. as a result so both of them you may have affected. a combination of both a hearing loss a hearing uh, uh, sound an abnormal tinnitus a bit of swaying starts then the person gets really alerted oh i'm not able to balance myself is something really dangerous i was just thinking some water is there in my ear let's just ignore it for some time and maybe it will get all right on its own and it drags on for years sometimes they just don't find the time or don't find the you know, right person to go and discuss it with and often it gets ignored and sometimes we do find not very common but definitely we keep it in the back of the mind that there are some changes in your uh, auditory or hearing nerves so this is the neural part now the other part is the vascular part Vascular part, when I say, it means something to do with the blood circulation. So the blood circulation, which is very complex, starting from the heart and going towards the brain, it goes en route through the ear 
and the hearing part and the back of your neck. So sometimes there are some kind of a swellings. Either it can be both extreme. There can be some swelling or some kind of a disturbance in your vertebral system or the carotid system. Sometimes there can be a blockage or something like plaques, how you get in you know, cholesterol plaques and you get atherosclerotic plaques. So we try to investigate that aspect as well by doing what we call as a simple one, which is a uh, vertebral uh, uh, basilar this thing, ultrasound. So an ultrasound blood flow or a Doppler ultrasound helps us to understand the blood circulation. If the blood flow from the heart through the vertebral and carotid system, which is going to the brain, has got some narrowing or some obstruction or some excess flow. So these are the other causes for tinnitus, which may be manifested in a different way. They may be more of a whoosh or a pulsating sound. Sometimes we get a very classical description that uh, we have something like a sound coinciding with my heartbeat. I feel mm -hmm. one heartbeat here and one sound here, or they are coexisting at the same time. In that case, we always think this is another possibility that there is a heart-related problem or a blood circulation-related problem, which can be detected by doing an ultrasound Doppler of the vertebral and carotid system. To go still further, if you want to go uh, more detail into this, we uh, also suggest a MRI with an angiogram. So the dye is injected during the MRI. It flows through all the blood vessels in your neck and your brain and see if there is any narrowing. So it can be either a narrowing or it can also be an excess flow or something like a uh, aneurysm or something like a swelling in your blood circulation, which causes more fast sounds and the blood flows in a different velocity. So the body is very perceptive. So usually we have to take this symptom with some kind of a seriousness. Nobody comes to make a joke, isn't it? So if there is any symptom which is very diagnostic of this, it's good to go to the maximum extent if there is a possibility of some kind of a changes in the blood circulation, which can be picked up by either an ultrasound Doppler or still higher if you want to go, go for a MRI angiogram, which helps us to understand changes in the blood circulation of the patient. Okay, now we'll come to some very common medical causes also. What are the very common medical causes? Just a simple anemia. What happens in anemia? Your hemoglobin is down. When your hemoglobin level is down, what happens is that your oxygen carrying capacity of your blood is reduced. The person is feeling little tired. So the blood has less ammunition so it has less hemoglobin it flows with more force so that is called mm -hmm. as a hyperdynamic circulation which means the blood circulation is going with more force through the same vessel so that is perceived as a whoosh sound and it goes through so if you look at a simple cause like you know uh, a hemoglobin test that can give us a clue if there is something like a anemia which can cause these kind of uh, hyperdynamic sounds or sounds of a blood flowing with more velocity, more speed, which is again perceived as a distressing whoosh sound through the ears or through the head. So that can be one reason. Other common reasons could be vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin B12 and vitamin D deficiencies are so, so common with more and more of indoor activity and less of sun exposure. The vitamin B12 levels, when they plummet down, it causes a lot of uh, changes in your myelin transmission, your uh, your neural system, which has got a myelin coat and the neural transmission is highly facilitated with a good vitamin B12 levels and the drop in vitamin B12 levels can cause some amount of variation in your neural transmission and your neural symptoms, which again may be perceived as some kind of, you know, abnormal sensation. It's a very varied uh, spectrum of sounds, which a patient may feel somebody may describe it so vividly that we are lost you know like there's there's such a big description of how all different kinds of sounds can come in your body or your ear or your head and uh, that is so one person you know, might have whooshing and ringing and this all, uh, all at different times at different times but usually it will stick to 
one type of a sound which the person classical describes it always increases when the person is in a silent zone now i'm mm. sitting with lot of noise no the external noise masks this sound so i'm not able to perceive it but the classical fear will come when it's going to be night because when everything is silent this mild noise becomes terrible and irritating and sinister can even make me lose my sleep so mostly the fear or the description of symptoms comes when they are like you know so when it comes to the night i am gone now this yeah. is very very troublesome in the night it can make me an insomniac because i am not able to sleep at all to do something for that so this is the one of the main uh, presenting symptom this is how we take them through different types of investigations to rule out drug history to rule out occupational history to rule out vascular causes to rule out neural causes to rule out uh, hearing damage and also to rule out more dangerous things like brain aneurysms or nerve tumors or brain tumors in the brain stem which can cause these kind of abnormal sounds coexisting with other factors of course like giddiness imbalance and like it's amazing how all of this is so connected in in, in this yes doctor a question a person who doesn't have tinnitus in a quiet room will hear what he won't hear anything Why? zero like like it will be zero or there will be a ringing there will be a slight hum like what is it that the is so some mild environmental that? sounds may be there i don't think anything mm. you should have more than uh, routine environmental sounds in your vicinity which can be mm. uh, sometimes pleasant sometimes if it's the barking of a dog it can be irritating to you as well in the hmm. middle of the night but bottom line bottom line is that if you are uh, not suffering from tinnitus usually you have a undisturbed sleep you don't feel any kind of you know phantom noises during the late nights and early uh, mornings which is the maximum quiet time when you perceive these sounds to get exaggerated and disturbing in nature before coming into how we can how we can find ways of treating it and what we can do to solve it mm. i just wanted to understand so tinnitus is taking place mm. like you said it disturbs sleep what are the other aspects of life have you noticed amongst your patients that it has disturbed or you know it affects does it affect a, a person mentally does it affect a person relationship wise how does it have you noticed that affecting people yes so uh stress is a very very common factor sometimes the patient themselves give us a point i have been very fine sir off late my office stress has increased and my tinnitus has increased so it manifests as a a withdrawal symptom a, a stress symptom it reduces your efficiency it reduces your work performance it reduces your sleep more than anything else makes you drowsy and inactive and lethargic in the mornings or it makes you somewhat less eager to interact you are bordering on you know sometimes depression people go into depression to the extent we have even used antidepressants as one of the treatment for it is an established treatment for tinnitus because it helps to improve your neural capacities so basically it is a, an altered uh, social behavior if i may use if somebody see it depends from person to person some are brave hearts they'll suppress everything and move on with life there are some are the little more sensitive type who uh, you know exaggerate their symptoms and they allow those symptoms to take over their life so there again behavioral therapy also helps when we come to the part of uh, treatment strategies but basically it is disturbing to the extent it causes you a phobia to go into a room alone it can cause lot of interaction uh, problems it can cause poor work efficiency it can be a cause for your social withdrawal and many of these kind of social behavioral problems so um, yes. doctor the something interesting i don't know if if this happens to patients or not i'm just sharing an experience with you um yes. i feel that my i have a ringing sound that happens like i said i was that bomb blast during mm. one of those diwalis yeah. but whenever i am in a heightened state so for example you know like uh, something is happening and i'm like probably like the you know the little adrenal release is mm. taking place that's mm. when i see it suddenly going flaring up and then coming back down so it's almost like in my head i see it as my early warning system something's happening are they mm. related is it something that only 
have you heard of this part before so i think i can correlate it with something related to increased blood flow as i okay. told you whenever there is an increased blood circulation be it any cause so mm-hmm. the sounds which are uh, the normal blood flow see normal blood flow in my body should be silent i don't perceive blood flowing in my body but when it Correct. goes with extra velocity it can be in an excited state as you said or it can be in something like as i told you an example of anemia where the blood is more forced to rush with more velocity to compensate for the lack of hemoglobin lack of oxygen carrying capacity has to rush oxygen to the body parts with more speed because it has less messengers which are the hemoglobin mm-hmm. molecules so this can be one of the explanations when you are in a heightened uh, uh, no uh, state of excitement you can have a similar response like some blood sounds or no rushing in your head like how you feel some no an excitement running in your head something like that interesting interesting so doctor now once you've identified or you've gone through the diagnosis aspect of it how would you do the treatment of tinnitus does it ever completely go away that is it always partial how what what happens okay fine so the first part as i told you is to elicit the history and find out if there have been any precipitating or offending reasons so try to remove the reason which can be in the form of a medical uh, reason like i told you hemoglobin anemia or it is the thyroid dysfunction which can cause you know stress in your body thyroid uh, problems then uh, if there have been any drug intake for some infection which can be titrated or reduced or stopped and it can uh, give us some improvement in the tinnitus but by and large the maximum uh, battery of uh, medication which we use belongs to the vasodilator group so the variation in the blood circulation is adjusted by using some vasodilators in my understanding how they help or how i explain it to our patients is uh, it helps to improve the blood circulation of your inner ear it helps to uh, you know kind of uh, improve the oxygenation wash off the toxins which are accumulating there it him- helps to regenerate to some extent the health of your neurons though the hearing often is not recovered fully and it remains static but the sounds are mitigated to a last extent and i have found reasonably good responses as you said it may not go away completely but most of the uh, clients or patients they are happy if you are able to reduce the sounds to a tolerable level or it just become so mild it just stays in the background like some background music and uh, we don't have to be bothered and disturbed by it day in and day out and that helps us to help uh, the patient by using some medication the medication mostly is in the form of vasodilator medications which help to improve the blood circulation and sometimes as i told you some b12 b12 is usually a routine medication which helps to improve the neural pattern the neural transmission pattern if i may use the word so it helps to quieten the nerves and helps to give some kind of a relief in the uh, symptoms so usually it starts like reducing the loudness of the sound the i mean the medical response to treatment is manifested or described see again we can't measure the response we have to go by what the person says but usually when they come back after a course of 2 weeks or 3 weeks the usual uh, uh, the satisfactory response which we get is that we have found it has helped to the extent that the sounds have become very less or sometimes the sounds have become less frequent the loudness of the tinnitus has become less reduced to the extent i am able to tolerate it so that is a very encouraging response and we encourage them yes these are harmless medications they are based on the physiology just to alter the neural and uh, blood patterns and helps to improve your blood circulation helps to uh, strengthen your nerves to some extent helps to uh, give more blood circulation more blood flow or vasodilate your uh, inner ear and it helps to mitigate and reduce the frequency of tinnitus so this is one uh, group of medications which help the second group of medications which i told you we use uh, drugs which are uh, anxiolytics drugs which are uh, an antidepressants sometimes milder doses and they help to allay the anxiety because 
for every symptom there is the mind which also plays along with it so when we are able to remove the anxiety remove the fear improve the sleep make them sleep better relax the muscles relax the nerves it gives some amount of improvement in the tinnitus so there's a whole group of medications which are designed to do that i don't want to talk about particular prescription drugs which is not the right thing to do in such a podcast so i just want to give a broader uh, perspective that the group of medications which are used are basically vasodilators neurotropic agents and sometimes muscle relaxants anxiolytics these are the usual pattern of medications which help in this so that is the medical management part now we come to the other part which is confuse the brain by giving your own noise which is oh, called wow. as yes so the other pattern of treatment is to use some alternative noise which we call as wide band noise it may be as simple as something like you know keeping a transistor in in between two frequencies so you get one flat noise like this Correct. something like that so which we mm. call as a white noise so that is one of the frequent methods of training and nowadays there have been some self help apps also which give these kind of noises so you just put on that noise and sleep and that noise and this noise gets cancelled and this is called as tinnitus masking so you fool the tinnitus by giving another noise and now the brain is confused see it's a perception issue tinnitus is totally a perception issue especially if you have ruled out that there are no major tumors no major causes it is just some kind of a perception issue so you confuse it by using another strategy which is using a second line of noise which are there are ready made devices also available which you wear just like a bluetooth device or a hearing device and it's called as a tinnitus mask it generates a white band noise and that flat noise sometimes neutralizes the tinnitus and helps to alleviate that interesting this is the second line of treatment which can be in the form of tinnitus masking or generating mm-hmm. alternate noise so that this noise and that noise gets cancelled this is usually used in people who have not responded very well to medication want something more or something which has been you know not to their satisfaction so we give this as an option now if there is uh, a hearing loss associated if there is a hearing loss associated with the problem often supporting the hearing using a hearing amplifier or a hearing aid also helps to improve the sound signals from that ear so the brain balances it gets equal auditory inputs and somewhat it quietens the tinnitus and hearing aids are one of the treatment in patients who have been diagnosed to have significant hearing loss which is the cause for the tinnitus so giving some hearing support will help the tinnitus it's so interesting that you to add the sound into the ear instead of yes we, we normally would think of subtracting yes. but you can't subtract yes. because there's nothing to subtract yes so you have to give an alternate noise or give some hearing support so that uh, the cause for the tinnitus being hearing loss the hearing support improves your auditory signals to the brain and the hearing noise gets cancelled because now the brain is satisfied oh from the left ear also i'm getting some equal sound nothing is wrong i don't have to worry at all so that helps in giving hearing support as a treatment for tinnitus now coming next level as i told you it is a behavioral issue so we now have what we call as tinnitus training therapy or trt so we have audiologists who are trained to do that they give something like a cognitive therapy like you know you are trying to make them understand that this is not something which is dangerous this is not something you have to be afraid of this is not something it's part of you it's your own baby something you know it's like a psychotherapy along with the usage of uh, this uh, masking noise technique so you combine both which is done by specialists called audiologists they give this tinnitus training therapy and they help to adjust the tinnitus in the patient's head by giving some amount of uh, uh, therapy along with the a uh, wide band noise or the masking noise which helps to go for some kind of a alleviation or some reduction in the symptoms to some extent all this gets reduced significantly now 
next level when you are can i sorry add getting... one story to this before yes, we get yes, to the yes, next one please don't much. forget your thought though but yes. it is exactly what I, what you were talking about you know i realized after a while that this noise is going to be a part of me for forever so i was like and it's never leaves me so it's almost like my best friend so how do i use it instead of constantly wishing it was not there because if i wish it is not there it just keeps adding to my trauma that has happened in the past so yes. instead i said how can i use it as my best friend so i love for example when i'm meditating i love listening to that sound as my focus point yes right beauty when Beautiful. like i yes. like i said that you know when something uh, you know why am i feeling agitated my my tinnitus suddenly pops up i was like oh, ah you're oh. trying to be an early warning system for me oh, so that's the way oh. that i started playing around with it instead of wishing that it was not there absolutely what you were saying this perfect perfect so this is what exactly you're saying is what i am also trying to uh, uh, emphasize that it's a behavioral issue or it's the perception issue so when uh, tinnitus retraining therapy helps it's very good we also have the next level of uh, thinking or which we call as cognitive behavior therapy which is imparted by psychologists which is again completely tuning your mind just the way you said what is this is it going to you know uh, be your enemy or is it going to be your friend how can you use it in your life how can you forget it and uh, when your concentration is moved to something else and uh, you are able to live with it or you are able to use it to your advantage which is a part of cbt we call it as cognitive behavior therapy in which there is some kind of a psychological training given through multiple therapy session it doesn't happen in a single session so multiple therapy sessions are done this helps them to understand with the psychologist how to use this as a friend and not as an adversary how to utilize this as a strength and slowly when you move your mind out of it you are able to get out of it and this helps in one of the therapy methods for tinnitus then going further similarly breathing exercises pranayam yoga all these are proven to be when it is a primary tinnitus that means there is no secondary cause there is no secondary damage which has happened but there is a perception of tinnitus with no other specific reasons medication to some extent helps and these kind of alternative therapies which include psychotherapy behavior therapy tinnitus training therapy masking noise therapy and sometimes even a psychological counseling and using it as you said as a strength make it a you know a battery in your life to use it for some energy a positive purpose rather than a negative purpose so these are the various methods by which we can uh, counsel especially when there is no other major cause like suppose you are finding something major like there is some aneurysm in the brain there is some blood vessel which is ready to burst or there is some tumor you have to refer to the respective surgeons for managing it so those are secondary causes which need separate treatment based on the finding in the investigation but when all that is not there we have to use these primary methods for taking the patient depending on the level of uh, response which they give the level of uh, alleviation which they get we will be able to take them from one to the other and this helps to get them rid of their problem so now beautiful so, so I, I was just going to say like also pranayam would probably help in vasodilation and and yes, that like yes. breathing through Yoga your nose is makes a, fantastic a big difference thing. yes it's scientifically proven to remove each and every lifestyle disease there is an answer in yoga there is nothing which can't be you know alleviated by yoga i myself practice surya namaskar and you know other forms of yoga which is a life altering experience if you have to you know experience it to understand its importance and similarly as i told you breathing exercises what does yoga do it basically improves blood circulation from head to foot it is a vasodilator by itself so that Correct. again washes off the toxins removes the negativity improves the blood circulation helps the organ to get suffuse so absolutely these are uh, the proven treatments which we are already using now coming to experimental uh, or futuristic ideas and uh, what we have been studying or uh, you know experiments and trials are being done we have uh, done uh, what is called as a functional mri so what is a functional mri see mri is an image 
Now, a functional MRI is something in which they are detecting that part of the brain which is getting active during tinnitus. And research has proven that there is something uh, called as the caudate nucleus, which is one of the parts of the brain which has shown some kind of uh, vigorous activity when you do a functional MRI in patients with tinnitus. So a lot of uh, research is going on, though it is not FDA approved, we are not bringing it into practice, that some kind of uh, you know, uh, stimulation or some kind of an implant which is put in that active area, which is giving you that sensation of tinnitus, which is called as uh, a deep brain stimulation. So the deeper part of the brain, which is identified as an active uh, component participating in this perception of tinnitus that is quietened by giving some kind of a, you know, an implant in that area which is implanted and left there to quieten the area. Just how therapies are coming for diseases like Parkinsonism, they are finding the dopamine secreting area is given some implant to reduce or regulate the secretion of dopamine which controls your nervous system and the muscles in Parkinsonism. Similarly, uh, caudate nucleus the brain stimulation, it is uh, in experimental stages. Maybe we may have some answers in our lifetime possibly to see if that can be a promising uh, therapy for distressing tinnitus. That again will have very strict indications. Anybody who has gone through everything and is totally unable to control that, we will have to think of that as a futuristic option. Again, another uh, uh, option similar to that is some kind of a transmagnetic stimulation you put some magnetic electrode something like you say uh, acupressure for example so or you do magnetic therapy this also has got some kind of a futuristic trend and transmagnetic stimulation of the scalp gives suppose it's on the left side or the right side you give some kind of alternative therapy and it helps to alleviate the symptom or reduce the perception of tinnitus. See, all these are all perceptions. See, how do you get relief from headache by putting on Amritanjan balm? It doesn't Correct. cure your headache. It gives you a counter sensation, which is more powerful than the headache. This is called as the gate therapy in physiology of the brain. So when you give a counter sensation, the brain takes over that sensation, and forgets the first sensation. So this is uh, the principle on which all these alternative therapies are or the futurist, I won't say alternative, sorry. They are a scientific uh, experiments which are being done all over the world in important centers. And hopefully we'll hear about them in India very soon, giving some kind of a respite or a futuristic you know, option for uh, tinnitus treatment. So interesting. I like the way that it is making the sound or the pain different so you forget about what the original yes, simulation this was. Yes, the it's principle like... of all treatments. Hmm. My dad used to joke about this when we were in the swimming pool and we suddenly got a cramp in our foot. He would whack us and he was like, see, this is painting more than the foot now. You've forgotten about the foot. See? Absolutely. <laughs> so this is gait therapy at its best. Give a counter sensation and you forget the original sensation. Give the counter sensation. Doctor, what can we do to prevent it from happening? So say there are people who are listening who are like saying, that, oh, I don't have tinnitus. What are lifestyle things that we can do to prevent it from happening? What are things that we can do to take care of it from now onwards? You have to take care of your ears, basically. That is the commonest origin of tinnitus. So whatever and you nobody think... thinks about them at all, right? We just no, take it no, for granted no, till no. we can't yeah. hear. Now, see, I have given very simple examples to patients. Nowadays, we have these earphones uh, or you're uh, connected to your uh, mobile phone, for example. You have a marker. When you're crossing the volume beyond a point, it says, are you sure you want to go beyond that? There is a red and a green zone in your volume. So that is one way of understanding the problem. Like if you can regulate your exposure to loud noise, limit it. Yes, you should enjoy music to some extent, but keep it within uh, tolerable limits. See, your hand is made to lift, say, for example, 50 kg. If you lift 200 kg with your arm, is it not going to fracture? the ear is much more delicate than that. So if you subject it to a noise level which is beyond its capacity, it's going to get ruptured. The eardrum may rupture or your uh, uh, hearing fibers may start decaying. This leads to noise. Basically, I would say in one word, a noise hygiene. 
So that should be the best preventive strategy for tinnitus. Of course, other things are very specific, like use of particular drugs, and although that's not in our control, but in our lifestyle, I think if you can do one thing, practice you know, judicious usage of music and headphones, practice uh, noise hygiene in a way that you are not exposed to prolonged loud music at intolerable levels, and uh, avoid any kind of uh, prolonged uh, insults to your ear. Anything to do with chronic inflammation, anything to do with supplements that you can take that help with any of this uh, to prevent it from taking place? Preventive, I don't think so. It has much role. But yes, curative, definitely, as I told you, B, vitamin B12 supplements, antioxidants definitely help to some extent in alleviating the neural symptoms and help your uh, regeneration of the lost fibers to the extent that they cry less. I, this is how I explain. You know, it's like you're assaulted them. Now they are going to cry. You bear with it. So it's soothing it more than preventing it yes, in, that, yes, in that context. Yes. So it helps to soothe and regenerate the uh, lost fibers to the extent that they are able to reduce the noise input from the ears to the brain. Interesting. What about things like uh, noise cancellation, active noise cancellation, headphones? Do they make a difference? Do they not make a difference? Good, bad? What are your thoughts on it? No difference. See, ultimately, mm. noise cancellation headphone does prevent outside noise from coming to your ear. Am I right mm. in understanding? Correct. Yes. So how is it that plays going a to... anti-frequency so that it balances out the outside noise? Yes. Yeah, so that is only to make you listen with more intent so that the background or the outside environmental noise doesn't disturb your conversation or your understanding of the meeting. So mm. that way, I don't think that has any role to play. It is again, if you're using whatever headphone at an exceedingly high volume or for a prolonged duration, you're going to get into trouble with your ears. And that is mm. the root cause of the problem noise cancellation headphone or no noise cancellation headphone it is immaterial as per my understanding and if you're using headphones use them at the lowest volume possible give yourself yes. a break once in a while is yes help you can well. give a break in fact uh, they uh, the patient then said come sir i can't do without my headphones i have to do my meetings i have to live my life i said yes you have to live your life why don't you switch to uh, no, a speaker phone for some time. Why don't you try to close the door and use a speaker phone instead of plugging the headphones and putting it at the maximum uh, level of noise? Why don't you remove it for some time, inter uh, intervene with some speaker phone for two hours, go back to headphones for two hours when it's not crucial, change to speaker phone or use a Bluetooth or uh, use a, a direct conversation. Similarly, using mobile phones for very, very prolonged duration, the radiation part of it, that also has some amount of I say, okay, you switch to the good old landline when you don't need the mobile phone. Have a landline at home. So these are all very simple uh, lifestyle measures, which I think can be uh, good for uh, uh, prevention aspect. Interesting. Also, don't, don't headphones cause like bacterial infections and stuff? Because you're, isn't there moisture extra being yes, 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 yes. That's a no completely air different topic. Case. I'm not uh, that happens, talking right? about it. Yes. So there I would say more than headphones, it's the earphones which go inside earphones. the ear. So Correct. the earphones going inside the ear cause both friction as well as trauma. And moisture and sweat increases, leads to fungal infections, wax getting pushed, ear aches, and mm. those kind of problems, which are all external. They are all easily treatable. I'm not at all worried about them. But tinnitus ah. is in a different league at all. Totally a different, different zone league. altogether. Absolutely. Yes, yes. These are all very simple. Yes. You get them treated, get the ear clean, put some ear drops, you'll be fine with that. But those are all simple things. They are not at all things which are very uh, troublesome for us. But inner ear issues, again, external ear, very easy to treat. And middle ear, okay. But inner ear is the most difficult to treat. It's the most complex organ of our body with both hearing and balance functions. And we definitely need to give it the due respect it deserves. Very, very powerful. Last question before I, I leave yes. you. Um, is uh, the... People who go diving, for example, or adventure yeah. sports, right? Does mm. tinnitus affect that? Is there a correlation? Have you noticed anything? 
I think uh, it is more of middle ear which participates in high altitude sports because it's more of fluid accumulation which happens whether it's just a simple thing like an aircraft descent suddenly or people who are sensitive experience excruciating ear pain sometimes to the point of deafness when there is a landing because of sudden barotrauma there it's the middle ear which works there again it is more easily treatable we do see such patients again taking the other example which you gave like sky diving or scuba diving going deep sea diving these are the situation in which the middle ear usually gets affected with fluid accumulation or even a negative pressure accumulation in the ear so those things are different and they get treated slightly more easily and they are mostly the middle ear which participates in such altitude variation situations excellent Dr. Vijay, thank you so much for coming and sharing this. You know, like like we said, it's tinnitus awareness month, and I think so yes. many people have it. It's so important to have this information yes, out yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so be... so much for sharing and coming on the podcast. Thank Dr. you for having me. It was such Dr. a pleasure to, in to interact with you. With you. Yes, My we'll definitely stay in how can, touch. How can people get in touch with you and uh, put this conversation forward? Yeah. See, uh, I'll be available full time at Manipal hospitals in Whitefield all the days. So if you want, you can look up Dr. Vijay Ragachari. You'll easily find me on Google and it won't be difficult to meet me if you have a problem regarding tinnitus or anything in the ear, nose and throat. And it was such a pleasure. It was an enriching experience for me to you know, uh, revise mentally all the things which we have been uh, reading and doing. And it was fun to be on your podcast. You're an amazing host. It was lovely meeting you. And we look forward to more such interactions in future. Done, for sure. Next time I come to Bangalore, definitely coming to get my tinnitus checked with you. Uh, Thank you're you so much. You're most welcome. And I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.